Well, good morning, everybody. I hope we remember how to do this. It's been a while since, uh, since we've sat at this, in this room at this table. Uh, but uh, we're delighted to, uh, to be able to do it uh, today. I'm happy to be with my, uh, my colleagues. And uh, there's just, uh, I, th I think, a really encouraging atmosphere. I noticed it yesterday on the floor. And I feel it uh, again today. We did a lot of good work uh, toward the end of, uh, just before we broke for the recess. Got plenty of work uh, still to do. But I'm, uh, I'm encouraged that we're more than up to that. And we're delighted to uh, kick it off with, uh, with this, uh, this hearing. Um, in March, our, our uh, committee, you'll recall, our uh, committee held its first uh, oversight hearing on the bipartisan uh, infrastructure laws, drinking water and wastewater uh, provisions. Today, we're going to expand upon those efforts, uh, focusing on the, uh, the law's drinking water programs. Uh, nearly two years after becoming law, bipartisan infrastructure laws helping to make clean water a reality for millions of households, uh, for schools, and child care facilities across our country. And as the benefits of this law continue to become a reality in more and more communities across America, uh, our co committee is uh, uh, anxious to hear from stakeholders about how you believe this work is progressing. And if we uh, can make any uh, improvements, as my colleagues uh, have heard me say again and again, everything I do, I know I can do better. I think everything we do, we know we can do better. Investing in our nation's uh, water infrastructure is deeply uh, personal to me. Growing up in uh, West Virginia and Virginia, uh, my sister and I lived uh, near rivers and streams like Beaver Creek, right across, you know, not, not even 100 feet from our house. Uh, but uh, just outside of Beckley is a stream that was contaminated by septic tanks and other uh, waste. Later, I would attend Ohio State University as a Navy ROTC midshipman. And, and uh, uh, Ohio State is about a two-hour drive south of the Cuyahoga River which famously caught fire in 1969. Remember, I was down in Pensacola, Florida, it's a brand new, newly minted ensign, reading in, in the news that uh, the Cuyahoga River had caught on fire. I couldn't believe it. But uh, they, uh, it did, and uh, the question is what, uh, what we're going to do about it. Uh, both of uh, those experiences ingrained in me the importance of water in our daily lives. And from protecting our beaches and wetlands to maintaining our service lines and other ports, clean water is critical to our health and our nation's uh, economy. As um, many of us know, uh, Matthew 25 calls on us to care for those who are in need, the least of these, uh, including giving those who are thirsty something to, uh, to drink. I believe uh, that includes a moral obligation to ensure that all Americans have access to clean, safe, and reliable water services. Fortunately, I'm not alone in that. Uh, believe. Shortly after taking office, President Biden invited Senator Capito and me, along with Senator Cardin and others, to the Oval Office. He tasked us with leading the charge on updating our federal infrastructure investments, including our highways, our bridges, and our water systems. As many of you may recall, we rolled up our sleeves. We got to work after that meeting. Senator Capito, Senator Duckworth, Lemus, Cardin, Kramer, and I, along with our staffs, worked together to draft the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. We advanced this bipartisan infrastructure legislation out of our committee unanimously and later passed it in the full Senate by an 89 to 2 vote. I will never forget that day and an 89 to 2 vote on something that came right through our committee and something that we're enormously proud of. That water uh, bill combined with our committee's historic Highway legislation uh, served as the foundation of the bipartisan infrastructure law, which President Biden signed into law in November 2021, a day that many of us will long remember today. What a day. Uh, to, uh, to date, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is the single largest water infrastructure investment in our nation's history. Uh, through that law, Congress is investing an unprecedented $55 billion to improve drinking water and wastewater systems in communities across our nation, including replacing lead service lines and addressing uh, emerging uh, contaminants. And it was fully paid for. Still, there's more that needs to be done and more that can be done. And my hope is that today's hearing uh, will allow us to gain a deeper understanding of how the implementation of those historic funds is going. Our hearing also presents us with uh, the chance to explore future opportunities to improve our drinking water infrastructure and to make sure that the bipartisan infrastructure laws programs are benefiting com communities with the greatest need too. And while I'm excited to hear from all of our witnesses, I want to take a moment and welcome back Keisha Powell to the EPW 
uh, committee. And for those who don't know, Ms. Powell testified before a committee in 2021 when we were drafting the water portion of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And her testimony was instrumental in moving that package forward and we look forward to hearing your perspective on the law's implementation to uh, today. As I mentioned, this is not our first hearing on examining our nation's water infrastructure needs. It won't be the last either. And as you'll recall, earlier this year, we had a holding that with APA Assistant Administrator uh, Radhika Fox, I love to say that name, Radhika Fox, and other stakeholders to discuss some of these programs. Just this past May, Senator Padilla and Senators Padilla and Lummis also held a water affordability hearing at the subcommittee level, both looking at uh, low-income water assistance programs and what additional authorities or changes might be necessary to make those uh, programs function even better. Later this month, that same subcommittee will be reviewing tribal water needs. And I hope that this series of hearings will help us uh, inform us of what more we can do uh, to ensure that these programs continue to work even better as we face changes in our climate, our population, and our infrastructure needs. And with that, again, we're grateful uh, to witness, uh, to uh, agree to our panel of witnesses. Uh, we look forward to hearing from each of you today and as you bring the diverse experiences representing state perspectives, city water utilities, and rural water. Before we do that, though, we're going to hear from our ranking member, Senator Capito, for her opening remarks. Senator Capito, great to be back with you. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Carper. It's great to be back with you. I hope you had a nice break great. in the beautiful yeah. state of Delaware. Um, this is a great opportunity, I think, for the committee to get an update from stakeholders and uh, on the progress, as, as, the, as the chairman has lined out very uh, explicitly on uh, DEWIA, which was enacted in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, thank all of you for being here, several of which we've seen before, and it's nice to see you back in front of the committee. Today's hearing will focus on the critical importance of clean, efficient, and efficient uh, drinking water and wastewater systems for the health, well-being, and economies of our communities. It's vital that all Americans obviously have access to reliable water and sanitation that they can afford. The Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act, authored by this committee, is a critical component of the, in, um, the in, uh, investment, um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA. It has introduced new programs, opportunities, and support to meet the current needs and challenges in small, rural, and disadvantaged communities. During this hearing, we'll examine the current state of our nation's water resources, the challenges we face in safeguarding them, the successes and failures of federal agencies' implementation of policies from the IIJA, which was meant to ensure that every individual has access to clean and healthy drinking water and wastewater, and how other federal policies may be helping or hindering communities' efforts to provide for their, re for their residents. The IIJA, as the chairman said, authorized $55 billion in funding for a variety of water infrastructure programs. These programs aim to address the issues faced by our nation's water infrastructure, including grants for small and disadvantaged communities, funding for uh, lead service line replacement, and support for innovative water technologies. The IIJA recognizes that many communities are struggling with aging infrastructure and emerging contaminants, such as PFAS. Small, rural, and disadvantaged communities often lack the necessary resources and technical expertise to tackle these challenges, leaving them vulnerable to water quality issues and also public health risks. The IIJA offers funding opportunities for grants, low interest loans, and technical assistance to help ease some of these burdens. As we work to implement and secure funding for these programs, it's crucial to ensure that resources are directed toward the communities that are most in need based on actual public health and environmental risks. The federal government would also provide the necessary technical assistance and training to support these programs. Many of our small communities do not have this technical expertise. However, I have significant concerns regarding the EPA's approach to implementing the directives from Congress as it begins to allocate substantial financial investments to our nation's water infrastructure. The EPA has repeatedly tried to impose its, po its policies, priorities on states and communities, often in violation of authorities reserved to them under the Safe Drinking Water and Clean Water Acts. Regulatory obligations to meet vague environmental justice goals and inconsistent and untimely imposition of Build America, Buy America waivers have led to delays, cost overruns, and legal uncertainty. These unnecessary obstacles imposed by federal regulators are especially inappropriate 
when elevated inflation eats away at the historic infrastructure investments that America needs and that were demanded of Congress. Additional threats to reliability and affordability may come from other environmental regulations. In particular, failure to provide circular liability protections for water systems facing PFAS contamination will slam our water systems and their ratepayers while only enriching trial attorneys. As we have discussed repeatedly, West Virginia has had to deal with PFAS contamination originating, and I know your states have as well, both industrial and military sites, the two major sources of contamination natural, nationally. The concept of com polluter pays is enshrined in CERCLA and has had broad bipartisan support over the years. That is why I find it truly perplexing to hear that environmental group groups are actively lobbying against protections for water systems and other passive receivers. With PFAS contamination going back decades and regulatory efforts to protect our drinking water, which I support, there will be an increasing need to protect our water systems that had no hand in creating or didn't have the benefit from these chemicals. As we look to pre preserve <coughs> safety, reliability, and affordability of drinking and wastewater systems for the future and maximize the benefits of the IIJA's investment, Protecting passive receivers is something Congress must get right. I'll close by saying, with everybody in attendance already knows, water infrastructure investments are critical to public health, environment health, environmental health, and economic development. The successes we've had to date have been based in cooperative federalism as enshrined in the Safe Drinking Water and Clean Water Acts. Communities and states know their needs the best and need a helping hand from the, gov the government, but not a heavy hand. Thank you all for all you do to keep our country's water and wastewater system clean, healthy, and I look forward to hearing your perspectives on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, uh, for those words and for the opportunity to continue uh, our, uh, our, I think, important and uh, wonderful efforts in, in this committee on, on this front. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Secretary Beiser. Um, Senator Cardin has uh, is kind of graciously agreed to introduce uh, Keisha Powell, uh, one of his constituents. And um, I think Senator Kramer is going to introduce Eric Govolk. And uh, returning to uh, Secretary Beiser. Uh, Secretary Beiser is the uh, Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. My wife sends her best. My wife's in North Carolina, Appalachian State graduate. She sends her best. But uh, uh, the position that you hold is a position that you held, I think, since uh, Governor Cooper appointed you uh, to that leadership role. Oh uh, gosh, about th two, three years ago in 2021. 20, uh, I believe this is your second tour of duty at the agency, having previously served as the department's director of legislative and intergovernmental affairs. In August of 2023, uh, um, uh, Ms. Beiser was uh, elected to serve as president of the Environmental Council of States, ECOS, the national nonprofit, non Partisan Association of State and Territorial Environmental Agency Leaders working to improve the capability of a state environmental agency. Secretary Beiser, delighted that you're here. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Please proceed. Now, before you do, maybe I should introduce the other two witnesses. The other two witnesses. No, 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 we'll, we'll hold off on that. You just go ahead and then we'll come back and let uh, Ben introduce uh, uh, Ms. Powell and, and uh, Kevin introduce uh, Eric. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Senator Carper, Ranking Member Capito, um, members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today um, and talk about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the transformative investment that it has helped enable in North Carolina's water infrastructure. One of North Carolina's top priorities is ensuring that everyone in our state has access to clean drinking water and reliable water infrastructure, because without that, nothing else matters. I want to start out by sharing with you a story about the community of Ivanhoe, which is in rural Sampson County in North Carolina. The residents of Ivanhoe have been fighting for decades for the chance to connect to public water um, system. Governor Cooper and I had an opportunity to hear from these residents about what it was like knowing when they washed their white clothes that they would come out stained brown from the well water and how when it got cold that the water pumps would go out and a lot of times they wouldn't have water availability at all. But in 2022, thanks to federal funding, we awarded a $13.2 million grant to run 40 miles of water lines to connect 350 homes in Ivanhoe to the county water system for the first time. Other systems in our state are facing failing infrastructure, 
pumping stations that are being inundated as we have more frequent and more intense storm events. And some are still serviced by terracotta pipes or even in Liberty, North Carolina, I was visiting them. They actually have Orangeburg lines, which I had to look up. Um, and it's basically wood pulp sealed with tar. And you can imagine that they're literally disintegrating in the ground. It is vital that we confront each of the needs on the, to improve the resiliency of our system and to protect the health of our residents. I will add that North Carolina had a head start on handling large sums of water infrastructure dollars. Our state leaders chose to allocate a significant portion of our American Rescue Plan dollars to water infrastructure. It was $1.9 billion. The first thing we did was evaluate our processes because it's easy to spend money, but the challenge is investing it well. In order to ensure that the record amount of funding that we received reached the communities like Ivanhoe, we reimagined our grant making process. We canvassed every county health department in the state to identify where we had communities who did not have reliable access to clean drinking water or sewer services. And we conducted outreach to nearby utilities to ensure that they knew about these communities and encouraged them to do projects to connect these folks. We wanted to make sure it wasn't just the, the well-funded biggest utilities that were ready to go that we have gave everybody in North Carolina an opportunity to benefit from these dollars. And I'm proud to say that the changes are resulting in, so far, um, at more than 2,000 homes slated to be connected to public water for the very first time. North Carolina, Senator, as you mentioned, also has significant levels of PFAS contamination, which have affected rural and urban areas in our state alike. We especially worry about the cost um, and the burden on our small towns who cannot afford to shoulder the additional costs associated with treatment without outside help. EPA Administrator Michael Regan um, and fellow North Carolinian came to Maysville, North Carolina, a small town that was discovered high levels of PFAS contamination, which was likely the result of firefighting foam, to announce the IIJ Emerging Contaminants Funding for small and disadvantaged communities to illustrate the type of community that that was intended to help. While a facility in North Carolina gave us early experience in dealing with forever chemicals when a PFAS compound known as Gen X was discovered in the Cape Fear River in 2017, we also recognize that PFAS is larger than one company or one chemical. DEQ has been working with public water systems to assess PFAS levels and to help prepare for the upcoming national drinking water standards. We have identified 43 of our municipal and county drinking water systems that serve 3 million people that will need to take action in order to come into compliance with the proposed MCLs and protect public health. We are learning from and working with the public water systems that have already addressed PFAS in our state. I'll give you an example of the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority who spent $43 million on the installation of a granular activated carbon filtration system to treat PFAS coming from the Cape Fear River. From their experience, we know that the testing and planning and design work has to take place before you're ready to construct um, a treatment system. And this work can take up, you know, a year to do. So to help other utilities prepare for the needed upgrades that they'll need to make, we are making a significant portion of the early rounds of emerging contaminant funding from IIJA available for pl planning grants to help these systems identify and design the best treatment system for their situation. We appreciate the $23 million per year over five years that North Carolina is receiving for emerging contaminants through IIJA, but this shows that how much we're gonna need, um, the, the, what we were getting so far is just scratching the surface of the needs in North Carolina. We estimate that just for our state, it'll take between 661 million and $1.3 billion to install treatment technology at the 43 municipal and county water systems. And that number does not take into account the number of small water systems, which we are currently testing. All of this is on top of our normal water infrastructure needs because we haven't invested for far too long of 17 to $26 billion that we need over the next 20 years. So this reinforces the importance of IIJA and this committee's work and of the state revolving funds. I recognize that this is a policy and not the Appropriations Committee, but as the newly elected president of the Environmental Council of States, I would like to bring the committee's attention to the long-term threat that's uh, being posed to the state revolving funds by the FY24 appropriations bills. On behalf of ECOS, we are concerned about these developments of using congressionally directed spending out of the corpus of the state revolving funds. 
The proposed cuts would be devastating the state's capacity to meet current and growing environmental needs and harm the state-federal partnership that is crucial to protect public health and the environment throughout the country. Using supplemental appropriations in the IIJA to offset cuts in the annual uh, federal funding undermines the historic opportunity provided by this landmark legislation, which was intended to extend affordable financing for water infrastructure to more communities than ever before. This is not the time to take our foot off the accelerator. North Carolina will never stop working to ensure that all residents have access to clean drinking water and reliable water infrastructure, and I appreciate this committee's um, commitment to that same goal. So thank you for allowing me to be here today and share our experience with you. Now, since uh, you were your election as president or selection of president of, of ECOS, do you prefer to be called uh, president, Madam President, or uh, Madam Secretary? When... Secretary is fine. Thank all you. Right, thank you. Very I enough. appreciate it. Good enough. All righty. Uh, ben uh, uh, Cardin's well, uh, willing to introduce his uh, constituent, uh, Keisha Chappelle. Well, Thanks Mr. Chairman, thank you. It's really a pleasure to have Keisha Chappelle with us. As you pointed out, her help in the work of this committee by her uh, appearance and, and counsel has been greatly appreciated. She's a dynamic force in the global water sector with 24 years of experience both in the public and private sector across the United States and London, England. Uh, she is the general manager and CEO of the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. Uh, that is the largest water utility in the state of Maryland. Uh, she manages 1,680 um, team members uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of the water systems, 1.9 million customers. Um, so it's an incredible responsibility that she has, and she has demonstrated great leadership in that regard. She's a licensed professional engineer in Maryland, graduating from Morgan State University. We always give plugs to our, our great schools in the state of Maryland. And I particularly want to thank her. Um, uh, Mayor uh, uh, Brandon Scott just announced his appointments to the task force set up by the Maryland General Assembly for the Regional Water Governance Task Force in Baltimore. Now, the Washington Suburban Sanit Sanitation Commission, Sanitary Commission does not have jurisdiction in Baltimore, but she's lending her expertise because we need to find the best way to manage our water systems in the Baltimore area, and I thank her for her willingness to serve on that task force, and thank you for being with us today. Ms. Powell, you're recognized. Thank you, Senator Cardin. It's good to be born, raised, and educated in the city of Baltimore. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and committee members for the invitation to testify before you today. I'm Keisha Powell, the General Manager and CEO of WSSC Water. I'd like to recognize our Board of Commissioners and Chair Regina Speed Bost. WSSC Water has the honor of serving more than 1.9 million she customers. Here? She's not. She couldn't be here today. WSSC Water has the honor of serving more than 1.9 million customers across Prince George's and Montgomery counties as the largest water and wastewater utility in the state of Maryland and the eighth largest in the country. While the scale of utilities differs across the water sector, we all face similar challenges. Most importantly, the need to balance affordability with investments in critical infrastructure. So the passage of the, his, the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act made us all hopeful that the historic funding levels would unlock the ability to ramp up required investments. Thank you, committee members, for your leadership and vision. I am happy to report that we see progress because of the IIJA. Overall, we have received a total of $60.3 million because of the increased appropriations in Clean Water and Drinking Water SRF funding with over 30% being given in loan forgiveness. Most notably, WSSC Water will receive just over $105 million from the state revolving funds in the coming year for water main replacement projects, lead service line inventory and replacement, the Piscataway Bioenergy Project, and sanitary sewer reconstruction. Thank you, Senator Cardin, for your support and leadership in advancing these crucial projects. 
While progress is being made, thanks to the single largest ever investment in water infrastructure in the history of the United States, the hard reality is we are still behind when it comes to having the necessary funding required for our infrastructure investment needs. We are truly thankful, but this one-time investment was only 5% of the funding that is needed for our sector. EPA estimates a needed investment of $750 billion over the next 20 years just to maintain the existing nation's drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. Historic decreases in federal funding, aging infrastructure, climate and cyber threats, and addressing emerging contaminants widens the funding gap. One of the most expensive and urgent issues our nation's water sector faces is the presence of PFAS contaminating our water supplies and threatening WSSC Water's mission to protect public health and maintain our track record of zero drinking water quality violations in our 105-year history. We are committed to continuing this level of excellence despite our projected costs of PFAS compliance of more than $1 billion for drinking water alone. We are equally concerned about the potential financial, operational, and compliance risks associated with PFAS in wastewater and biosolids, which is why we must hold the polluters financially responsible and not leave our customers to shoulder this burden. These factors have led to increasingly unaffordable water bills for families across the U.S. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, water is the fastest growing household utility cost nationwide. And the Congressional Budget Office reports that over 90% of water and sewer infrastructure in the U.S. is funded locally, much higher than other types of infrastructure like roads and transit. I thank this committee for authorizing the creation of a water customer assistance program at the EPA and for providing $1.1 billion in various COVID relief packages for a program at HHS. Since 2020, WSSC Water was able to provide over $10 million in financial assistance, including nearly $4 million from the HHS Low Income Household Water Assistance Program to assist more than 5,500 customers. The EPA program has never been funded, and the HHS program will soon expire without additional funding, ending this critical lifeline. We must permanently fund access to water, an equally critical resource. On behalf of WSSC Water, I thank committee members for your support and pledge to work with you to address the water sector's challenges in the years to come to protect public health, create jobs, enhance economic growth, safeguard our environment, and drive equity and environmental justice. This concludes my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Powell, thanks uh, so much. Great to see you again, and thanks for, for that testimony and for your, your, your help uh, earlier and, uh, and again to uh, today. Before uh, Senator Kramer introduces uh, our, our witness from, uh, from North Dakota, Eric Volk. Uh, I just want to say uh, to, uh, to our, my colleague, Kevin, uh, I was back on the campus of uh, the University of Delaware last month and had an opportunity to speak, uh, spent a fair amount of time with our president and others on the campus uh, about uh, the, uh, the intersection between the federal policy and what we're trying to accomplish at the University of Delaware. We talked a little bit about sports and we talked about the upcoming football season that's underway. And we talked about the University of Delaware's experience in playing North Dakota, North Dakota State. And I asked my staff to just to, to, just to share with me some football scores from um, the North Dakota State and Delaware in the last couple of years. And I came up with September uh, 2019, uh, University of Delaware 22, uh, North Dakota State 47. Uh, September 18, and the University of Delaware 10, and uh, North Dakota State uh, 38. Basketball, it gets worse. Uh, <laughs> basketball, uh, University of Delaware, 66, and uh, North Dakota State, 85. And when the pre president is leaving, the president of uh, the University of Delaware was leaving and we're saying goodbye, he said, do you have any advice for me before you leave? And I said, stop playing North Dakota State. <laughs> <laughs> they right. probably pay them a lot to play them. That's the weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, but they're not alone. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Senator Capito, for this important 
a hearing and, uh, and for this opportunity. Um, it's, it is an honor for me to be able to introduce Eric Volk, uh, who serves as the executive director of the North Dakota Rural Water Systems Association, where he, he has a staff of 11 professionals who oversee and provide services to over 300 water systems in the, in the state and, and wastewater systems. They include things like um, on-site troubleshooting, training, leak detection, uh, water audits, emergency response, workforce challenges, of course, uh, just to name a few. And, and the, the assistance provided by Eric and his team to my staff and me has been invaluable, and it's part of what makes the partnership work so well. He also serves on several boards, um, including the North Dakota Water Coalition, uh, North Dakota Education Foundation. He's a past chair of the North Dakota section of the American Water Works Association. So I, I don't know what he does in his spare time, but he does hold a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Mary, and he's a two-time member of the university's Athletic Hall of Fame. Fortunately for Delaware, he didn't go to North Dakota State. But Eric is, Eric is an excellent resource to me and to my staff. And we really appreciate Eric's being here and, and offering his expertise to the whole committee. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Please, uh, please proceed, uh, Eric. We're delighted that you're here. Thanks so much. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, Senator Kramer, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Eric Volk, and I'm the Executive Director of North Dakota Rural Water. The association was established in 1974 and provides technical, managerial, financial assistance, training, and advocacy for rural water and wastewater systems in the state. A huge thanks goes to my staff who tirelessly work every day to provide access to affordable, ample, and quality water. It is a true honor to be here today to give a small state rural perspective to the implementation of the Drinking Water and Wastewater Act. I grew up in Granville, North Dakota, a community of around 240 residents, so this topic is near and dear to me. I am also here on behalf of National Rural Water Association, the country's largest utility association with over 31,000 members, dedicated to drinking water quality, environmental protection, and public health in all 50 states. I've enjoyed living in North Dakota my entire life and have been helping water and wastewater systems for nearly 23 years. We have 306 active community water systems, 296 of them serve less than 10,000 in population. Meeting the demands and repairing of replacing aging infrastructure and complying with rules and regulations are taking its toll on many small and rural systems. Another major challenge is the ever increasing out migration, which continues to decrease the population base adding to the cost of these services to the individual consumer. Without significant state and federal grant funding, the cost to the consumer would be too much for the average family to afford. In 2022, the association partnered with the North Dakota Department of Water Resources and our League of Cities to survey our water supply needs. The results indicated a 10-year need of approximately $2.1 billion and a 20-year need of approximately $3.6 billion. North Dakota's current drinking water SRF program intended use plan shows a need of about $1.1 billion and demands on the clean water side are similar. Huge needs for a state that only has 280,000 residents. In preparing for this hearing, I visited with several water systems, engineers, and suppliers to develop a snapshot of how projects are being completed in the state. First and foremost, they are all very appreciative of the investments being made on the federal level to help our citizens. Several systems talked about the shortage of contractors. A key factor contributing to the shortage is labor, which has required reductions in the number of crews that they can operate and limits their scope of work. There's also a sense with the large amount of funding available for all infrastructure that some contractors are not as hungry as they were before. The cost of pipe, valves, and fitting is dramatically increasing. Since 2019, certain PVC pipe has increased over 200% and the cost of installing a fire hydrant that serves a small community of 135 people has more than doubled since 2020, now more than $15,000. Various products such as meters, meter pits, certain valves, drives, and generators have extremely long wait times. One system has been waiting for a year and a half for a specific pressure reducing valve. However, the availability of pipe and related materials is improving slowly. American manufacturers have been required to expand their facilities and improve logistics, which has driven down lead times and enhanced trackability. Overall, the cost of the completing projects seem to be ever increasing. It is very hard for small systems to properly plan for and complete projects under these circumstances. 
Another important aspect of the IAJA is the multiple technical assistance provisions and set-asides included by this committee to help communities that lack the financial, managerial, and technical capacity to access SRF programs. Rural Water is proud to be the trusted resource and technical expert for small, rural, disadvantaged, and tribal communities to comply with EPA regulations, avoid EPA fines, and access the historic water infrastructure funding for safe, safely operating our utilities. The regulatory burdens surrounding PFAS are another challenge facing water system, which we are extremely supportive of the Water Systems PFAS Liability Protection Act introduced by Senator Lummis. This legislation aligns with the goal shared by all rural communities to eliminate PFAS from the public drinking water while preserving the essential polluter pays principle for cleanups under the Superfund law. Finally, the water sector workforce problem is daunting with over 50% 50, 50 of our water workers estimated to leave the next 10 years. Alongside strong support from ranking member Capito, Rural Water has established an apprenticeship program for operators. As of this year, 36 state rural water associations, including North Dakota, have completed the rigorous process of obtaining federally approved apprenticeship programs and are now attracting training and retaining the next generation of water workforce, with over 600 apprentices enrolled or graduated so far. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to share Rural Water's perspective today we appreciate the many opportunities you have provided rural America in crafting federal water legislation and policy. Mr. Volk, thanks uh, very much, Mark. Thanks to all of you uh, for your, your testimony to, today. I'm going to uh, lead off the questions and then yield to Senator Capito. There's another hearing going on in Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs on postal issues that, uh, that are impo important. And I may have to slip out for a, a few minutes to, to go there as well. But as I mentioned in my, uh, in my opening statement, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law provided more than $55 billion for drinking water and wastewater improvements, the largest uh, investment in the nation's history, which is in addition to the significant investments Congress has made through the American Rescue Plan. Even then, we knew that this was only a down payment, and the continued need is clearer now. This past April, EPA released its most recent drinking water infrastructure needs survey and assessment which estimated that the 20-year national drinking water infrastructure need is a staggering $625 billion. That's $625 billion with a B. Uh, my question is really a question for, uh, for each of you. Uh, the question, uh, I'll start off, if I could, with Secretary uh, Beiser, also known as President Beiser. Uh, please share with us, if you would, uh, some of uh, your uh, uh, beliefs uh, with respect to uh, the bipartisan infrastructure, your experience with respect to the bipartisan infrastructure laws funding, uh, what you've been able to, uh, to achieve with that funding in North Carolina. Tell us a bit about the financial gap, if any, that remains in your efforts to address water infrastructure challenges. You've spoken to this already, but you can reiterate it, if you will. Repetition is a good thing. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for that question. You know, one of the things that we think about a lot in North Carolina is that people don't tend to think about water infrastructure unless they turn on their faucet and water doesn't come out or they don't have clean water, they have to boil water, um, or if they can't flush a toilet, right? That is when we typically think about water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we have underinvested for decades in our systems. And so um, we, this piece of legislation has provided a huge shot in the arm for us. You mentioned that the EPA needs survey is identifying you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in additional needs. Um, that is true in North Carolina as well. So we have a 2017 study that we are in the process of updating right now because it doesn't take into account some hurricanes that we dealt with that uh, estimated our needs at 17 to $26 billion just for our basic water infrastructure. So that's not including looking at the needs associated with um, upgrading our drinking water to deal with um, PFAS and protect public health. Um, so that's quite significant. To give you another dollar figure, um, we were only able in 2023 so far to, to fund 9% 
of the $2.6 billion that have been requested by our local utilities thus far. And that number has held pretty steady uh, for the past few years. We've had a record investment, which is wonderful. I mentioned the $1.9 billion from the American Rescue Plan on top of the wonderful uh, funding we are getting from IIJA. Uh, and we are working hard to make sure that that funding is reaching every community um, that needs it in the state. And that means, as I mentioned earlier, not just uh, rewarding those who are first in line, but making sure that we have strong technical assistance. North Carolina has a lot of small and rural communities, a lot of poor communities, and we want to make sure that that funding is reaching those communities as well. I'm going to ask you to hold it right there. That's, that's, you said that's a lot. That's, that's, and you, you got it, certainly got our attention. All right. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Powell, same question, if you would. Certainly. I think overall our experience in uh, working with stakeholders to make sure um, that we got off to a good start with implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law has been a positive one. Um, we understand that there had to be uh, guidance provided up front for implementation. And certainly for the state of Maryland, uh, they took some time to um, update their de definition of disadvantaged communities to make sure um, that the uh, that funding is going to support those communities across the state. Um, we are starting to see funding, as I shared in my testimony from um, IIJA, um, and we are starting to see some principal forgiveness. But what we talked about um, uh, in the hearing before was that we needed to see more. Uh, funding in the form of grants and not loans. Uh, many communities cannot afford loans. Um, and for us, ourselves, we're financially constrained as well. Um, it counts against um, the, the debt that we are taking out for our capital program. Um, so there's still a funding gap there. We submitted a project, a list of project requests uh, worth $800 million, and we're projected to receive 105 million dollars, so we're still shy of the need. Um, I think it has been uh, very good that we've been able to assist customers that need assistance uh, getting their bills back in good standing um, from impacts during the pandemic, but those impacts existed before the pandemic and continue to persist. Um, the last thing I'll stress, if I could, is just we talk a lot about investment in infrastructure. We can't forget about the people that run the facilities and fix the pipes. We also have to invest in workforce. Good. Thank you very much for those words. So Mr. Volk, and, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Senator Capito. Thank you, Chairman. Our SRF group has been working very hard uh, to navigate through the new rules and regulations to get the money out uh, as best as they can visiting with them in the last couple weeks, um, getting a lot of the money out to all sorts of systems, and I have in my written testimony just a snapshot of those systems, both on the clean water side and on the, the drinking water side from our, our very small up to our, our largest community of, of Fargo. All right, thank you. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to, because there's lots going on, uh, I'm going to yield my first opportunity to question to Senator Bozeman. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate that. I've got to run to a farm bill here. Uh, it's, it's important to you, and uh, I think to the, to the witnesses. But I wanted to just ask one question really quick regarding as ranking member on agriculture uh, to Ms. Beiser. I understand how critical it is that we protect farmers, ranchers, and others not directly responsible for PFAS contamination from being potentially held liable by the EPA or subject to sweeping private legal action that could wreak havoc on their ability to operate. So I was pleased to be a part of a bill with Senator Lummis giving the agriculture community assurance they would not be subject to PFAS liability claims if the EPA rule were to be finalized. Can you, Ms. Beiser, can you talk about the importance of providing farmers, ranchers, and water utilities uh, with this certainty? Thank you, Senator Bozeman, for that question. You know, one of the things that we think about in North Carolina a lot is making sure, PFAS operates fundamentally different than most of the traditional contaminants that we regulate. Um, PFAS, it's called a forever chemical for a reason, and it stays persistent in the environment and accumulates. And so one of the things that we're doing at a state level is reviewing our rules and regulations and permitting to make sure that 
Uh, they, we've got common sense measures to make sure that we're still protective of public health and the environment in that context. And I think, as you point out, Senator, um, I think it's a, a good and worthy conversation to have to make sure that um, that we are looking at where to appropriately draw those lines to ensure that you're not having unintended consequences because PFAS is operating differently um, than what we have traditionally dealt with, especially under a circular context, as you mentioned. So if they did go all the way down, farmers, ranchers, water utilities, what effect would that have on North Carolina? So I'll say as a, as a strong agricultural state, I always think about our farmers, but I also think about our, about our public water systems. And one of the main areas I think about is ratepayers are already paying to, um, for treatment costs to make sure that their water meets federal drinking water standards and is um, safe for public health. Um, and so I would hate to see a scenario where we have public water systems, ratepayers essentially, on the hook twice. Right. Um, so thank you for your, for your question. No good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Powell, um, let me first uh, relate a story. A couple of years ago, I was invited by a candidate for city council in Baltimore to join him going door to door uh, to try to get political support for him. So I, it was an opportunity to do some grassroots politics. Every house that we had knocked on the door where someone answered the door, the question they raised were water prices and the affordability of water uh, from our public utility. And you mentioned that in your, your testimony. And obviously, uh, and, and Secretary Visor, you're absolutely right, the, there's a tremendous shortage in the uh, modernization and replacement of our water infrastructure. And the pressure on the ratepayers make it virtually impossible to make the type of investment through the ratepayers that are necessary to make those improvements. But we're stuck with the current circumstances where these rates are way too high on affordability. Now, we have the LIHE program for other utilities. And you mentioned in your testimony, Mrs. Powell, that uh, you've used the COVID relief funds that were un uh, provided under HHS. And the bipartisan infrastructure bill contained a provision that I sponsored with Senator Wicker and Senator Stabenow. Uh, to allow us to develop a pilot program on affordability with uh, help for those that can aff cannot afford it. So could you just go into a little bit more detail as to the need on affordability uh, as to uh, the customers in your region struggling to pay their current water bills, let alone if additional responsibilities are imposed upon them because of the challenges that you've mentioned? Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Cardin, for the question. And thank you for your leadership on this uh, issue as well. Um, since the start of the pandemic, WSSC Water has applied over $10 million in financial assistance to 5,500 customers um, through a variety of federal and state funding sources, including $3.75 million just from LIWAP alone. Um, which has helped over 4,000 customers. So the, the Federal Low Income Household Water Assistance Program has been another uh, opportunity for us to assist customers um, that, are, that have, have, have needs. And as I said, um, those needs existed before the pandemic because rates have been increasing um, and they will continue to persist after. Right now, we have over 90,000 customers that are behind on their water bills, um, leaving uh, more than 51 million in arrears. Uh, when we can't get the funding from our customers because we're not for profit, um, we uh, then look to raise rates, and that's an unsustainable solution. So having a permanent low-income household water assistance program provides us another way of providing the needed funding to help customers with the rising costs of water and, and sewer bills because our costs are increasing to deal with just maintaining the infrastructure we have and uh, new regulations that require us to invest billions of dollars will further add to that financial burden. And Secretary Beiser, you mentioned uh, the concerns on the ratepayers in North Carolina. Do you have a similar concern about the affordability in your state? 
that is something we think about a lot. We want to make sure that water is, aff is affordable. This is something that we think about in the context of PFAS as well. Um, as the, I gave the example of the Cape for Public Utility Authority. Their customers are now paying an extra $70 per month, uh, or sorry, per year, um, $70 per year to pay for that treatment system. So we are thinking about this all the time and looking at how do we make sure that everybody's at the table to help um, so that the ratepayers don't shoulder the entire burden. Ms. Powell, I mentioned uh, my thanks for being willing to join the task force in regards to the Baltimore system. Uh, the WSSC is a model uh, governance that uh, has worked extremely well among the Maryland, Washington, and suburb counties. It just is well supported and respected uh, by all the jurisdictions. The Baltimore system is one that's based upon the city's management, which has been an historic, goes back hundreds of years. So uh, we have serious problems at Back River, as I'm sure you are aware, in Patapsco. And I just hope that you can add some expertise as to how we can have a structure that can provide the, the future needs for the customers in the Baltimore region that depend upon uh, the Baltimore uh, Water Authority. Yes, sir, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, lending my expertise and working with the entire task force to ensure that the city of Baltimore has the structure that it needs for the water and wastewater utility, which is a regional utility and also among the top 10 largest in the country. I started my public sector career as the Bureau Head of Water and Wastewater for the city of Baltimore, so I know the operation well and I know many of the challenges and I think those have only become more difficult over time. Um, and I, I do see um, that the city of Baltimore is now starting to receive funding as well from IIJA, and I hope that the work that we do helps to inform um, how those funds should be spent going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, this is for all the panel, but I'm going to start with you, Mr. Volk. I want to go back to the PFAS circle uh, liability issue. You've all three addressed it, and I appreciate it. But as the chairman just said, repetition is good. Circle liability creates a significant risk for passive receivers. In other words, you didn't create it, but it comes into your water system. Often, uh, you're required to receive or treat PFAS uh, due to state or federal regulations. Water and wastewater utilities are particularly vulnerable to circle liabilities due to the essential and growing role in receiving and filtering PFAS. I believe um, uh, in North Carolina, you said you just uh, 43 systems had just installed uh, carbon systems. There are treatment, as, I, as, as, as you mentioned, treatment technologies that can remove it, uh, and it gets in granulated carbon filters, um, but this, it has to be transported then uh, and disposed of used filters as you uh, put new filters in. Um, wastewater utilities must contend with both industrial and residential contributors of PFOS upstream, the latter of which poses unique challenges due to the prevalence, as we talked, of PFOS in many consumer products. My questions are, can you elaborate on the risks and costs associated with transporting and disposing of PFOS contaminated materials? And does circular liability impact your ability to manage these byproducts effectively without fear of severe legal challenges? If the EPA is requiring you to provide PFOS-free drinking and wastewater, are you kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, Mr. Volk? Senator, uh, great questions. Uh, a lot of these are on the minds of not only the small and rural systems in North Dakota, but across the, the nation. Um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns with, especially in our state, um, with what the extent of the PFAS is, and then if you find it, what do you do with it? And then if you're told you need to dispose of it, where do I dispose of it? How much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? If it's the rate payer, like we've already talked in the short time, we're already strapped, razor thin budgets. That's where uh, being exempt from the liability would be an extreme help to, to water systems where they're just, like you said, the passive receiver. They didn't profit from the, the PFOS, um, but now they're um, responsible, responsible for, for that exactly. And, um, you know, have you tested your water systems in North Carolina? Yeah, uh, Senator, they have done a couple years of, of okay. testing. North Dakota, we've been lucky, knock on wood, that um, it's come back with very few uh, positives across the state. Okay. Ms. Powell, would you respond to that? You, you, you mentioned it in your statement, but I'd just like to reinforce it, please. 
It's just like turning the mute button on on Teams. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Um, yes, I mentioned it in my statement that uh, we have been, uh, uh, we, we initiated some uh, looking at alternatives to possible to deal with PFAS in drinking water. Um, while we have done uh, voluntary testing and it shows that our levels are, are low, and that we would be uh, under the MCL that has been proposed by EPA, uh, we have seen an anomaly in the data that showed a spike that could potentially mean that we could be out of compliance in the future. Um, so that's why I mentioned uh, financial compliance and operational risks associated with not only drinking water, but also wastewater. Uh, we have to understand what will happen there and biosolids. So on the waste on the drinking water side, um, our estimates now are upwards of a billion dollars to be able to address uh, PFAS in drinking water. And um, just in terms of biosolids, the Piscataway Bioenergy Facility Project, um, where we have received funding from the state, um, that project is upwards of $270 million, the single largest investment that we have made as a utility. Um, and it's supposed to be a positive one to take our biosolids to a class A to allow us to better manage uh, biosolids. Um, that investment stands uh, to be threatened um, should we have to address PFAS and biosolids. So it's important um, that uh, water and wastewater utilities have the protections mm -hmm. uh, from CERCLA and from liability. Secretary Bowser, you have some experience with this, obviously with uh, some of your systems already doing the carbon filters. What, what kind of liability uh, issues would, are they having or will, would they have if, if we didn't specifically exempt them from transporting and, destroy, and trying to destroy, managing, once you catch it, it doesn't go away, what are you going to do with it? Senator Capito, thank you for that question. The, um, you know, there's a, two large systems that we have that, as you mentioned, are dealing with this. One is installed a reverse osmosis system, the other a carbon filtration system, granular activated carbon system. With the carbon system, one of the things that we worry about is we know that there's air transport of PFAS as well, and so as it gets refreshed, it gets basically heated up. We, um, you know, there's a lot we still need to learn about, are we putting it back into the air where it essentially continues a cycle? Um, so I think there's, that points to a need for some research and development to help us as we are tackling these issues. As it relates to CERCLA, I think, again, it's a really worthy conversation to have to take a look at all the case law surrounding CERCLA, having uh, everybody around a table to say, where are the unintended consequences and how do we avoid unintended consequences so we don't overburden our ratepayers? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and, and welcome to you all. Um, there, I want to direct my questions to you, Mr. Volk, because I have two rural uh, pollution problems uh, that I want to address. One is in Morrow County, and uh, for decades, people have had an accelerating level of nitrates in their water to where it's way above safety now, and they're experiencing all kinds of health problems. They are adjacent uh, to an area that does have a public water system. The DeWea grants, the $35 billion that we've directed to DeWea, wouldn't that be appropriate money to be spent to connect these folks to a, a public water system that's free of nitrates? Isn't that kind of the purpose? Uh, yes, yeah, Senator, you know, I believe that, that those would be, um, you know, questions to ask your, your Department of Environment and Quality or whoever runs the SRF, but definitely could be, you know, part of the, the supplemental funding. You know, that's just extra additional uh, funding, and there was additional subsidies that could be used there. They could use their, their, their base funding, but definitely could, could be something to get those users on a reliable uh, quality source of water. But isn't that kind of the core purpose of the DeWea money is to help folks in rural areas uh, be able to address this kind of challenge? Uh, Senator, uh, it definitely, definitely, you know, it would be up to, to each state to, to divvy that money up how they uh, f see fit. Right. So I want to turn to uh, another challenge in uh, Crook County. And in uh, uh, Crook County, uh, we've had in 2022 a whole bunch of residents who have a very, very high level of manganese uh, has appeared in their, their, their water. Now, Canada uh, has a limit of 120 micrograms, and, and the World Health Organization, 80 micrograms. Uh, EPA is at 300 micrograms. 
Uh, and um, the, uh, the estimate uh, for the impact on memory, attention, and motor skills in children is when there's 120 to 400 micrograms. And um, 10 of the 13 nearby family wells have tested over the EPA 300 level, and one well tested at over 1,000 micrograms. And uh, so they, people are incredibly worried about their health. Uh, the um, uh, calves are, are dying. At Billy Johnson's dairy, a record number of cows have been uh, dead. Same story at uh, Brian Zednick's uh, place. Uh, a farmer, uh, Dick uh, Zimmerly, said, it just chapped my backside that Goliath could get away with running over everybody else. And the Goliath in this case is a gravel pit that opened uh, nearby. In this case, there is no uh, public uh, water system nearby to, to, to tap in. What can these funds in DeWea do to help our rural uh, farmers and, and families that are being impacted in, in such a, a, a fashion? Uh, Senator, I can, I can only tell you what we, we've done in, in North Dakota over the last 50 years. We uh, have a great network of rural regional systems that would provide water to that farmer. We've worked hard on it. And I know the manganese is an issue in, in North Dakota. We've been able to use the, the funding through the emerging contaminants section. That's uh, eligible use, and that is that 100% um, uh, subsidy. So if they were able to hook up to a, a regional supplier like we've done in North Dakota, that that would be an option for those rural residents and farmers. And you're talking about piped water, right? Correct. But if people are too far away from a pipe system to make that feasible, is there other things that these funds can do? You, Senator, I'm, I'm not exactly uh, sure. We'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Well, Madam uh, Chair, I just want to uh, uh, provide for the record several articles uh, about both the nitrates in Morrow County and uh, the challenge faced there for health, and also about the uh, manganese uh, in Crook County. I think these two instances are, are e examples of the sorts of challenges uh, that people face. And, and it isn't just the farmers and, and ranchers. Uh, the family's uh, water systems, that is, as there's their, their, their pipes, their filters, their water heaters, uh, their toilets are filling up with black sludge, uh, massive corrosion of their pipes. They can't sell their, their homes. They're afraid to raise their, their children, but they can't afford to move. It seems to me like these are exactly the sorts of things that we're trying to provide funds for and DeWea to assist, and I want us to find a way to help uh, these communities out. Without objection, we'll submit those in the record. Uh, Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, again, thanks to all of our witnesses for being here. Eric, thank you um, for your for your expertise. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the um, sort of what was the one of the process issues, and I think actually in, in some in some respects, Senator Merkley's questions are about the program in general and and how states can can use the various stacks in, in the appropriate ways. One of the areas, and we've talked a lot about the state revolving loan fund, obviously, but one of the areas with regard to the state revolving loan fund and the, the bigger system is an area for rural people like me. And by the way, this, is, this applies not just to water, but certainly to the highway piece of it as well, and that is to have a formula that consistently recognizes rural states and the needs, the unique needs of rural states, and we don't have a formula that simply sends all the money to large population centers. Obviously, we're, we're talking about a, a multiple-use system that connects, and I appreciated your illustration, actually, to Jeff with regard to re the regional systems in North Dakota that work together. Could you maybe speak a little bit to the importance of the, of the formula piece of this? Because the, the formula is often challenged when it's time to reevaluate and reauthorize the, the, the programs. Um, maybe you could speak to that. And then the, you said something in your, in your opening statement too I'd like you to, to speak a little more to, and that is the technical assistance piece. From, in all my years in Congress, whenever this came up, the thing I hear the most from the rural systems is the value of technical assistance. How, if you even know how to apply for a grant, it helps perhaps get the grant. And maybe speak to those two things, the formula and then the technical assistance piece. Of it. Thanks, Senator Kramer. Yeah, definitely on the formula and coming from a, 
a small state. Um, we would love any changes or anything that, you know, wouldn't harm small states with limited population. Just because we don't have the residents doesn't mean we have, don't have problems. We have our unique problems, whether it's miles of pipe between rural customers, um, an extremely short construction season. I'm looking forward to getting back to our cool temperatures and <laughs> in North Dakota has been extremely warm here in, in DC, but definitely just, uh, you know, normally as a small state, we get minimally funded and, and we're okay with that just as long as we're not adversely affected by any, any formula change based on a population alone. And then with the technical assistance, that's the heart of our association. We've been around since 1974. Uh, helping when they were first starting rural systems in, in the state and, and morphed into uh, training technical, managerial, and financial assistance to all the water, water and wastewater systems in the state where my staff is going in there day in and day out helping with um, finding leaks, fixing things, helping them fill out loan applications, helping, helping them uh, connect to the funding sources, helping them hire an engineer if they don't have that. And some of these very small systems you even have um, you know, part-time staff or, or volunteers. So the technical assistance is really, to us, it's the, it's the boots on the ground. They know us. We live in their communities. We live in the state, and, and we're not there one day and, and never to be seen again. We're, we're there for the long haul. Well, I might even just follow that up then with, with the next point. So the technical assistance, it seems to me, helps 11, I still sort of marvel, at 11 professionals with over 300 systems. And I think what you've just described is a way that you maximize um, those resources. But that doesn't change the fact that there is a pretty significant workforce challenge. There is in every industry. I don't know one yet that Space Force is doing well, I guess. But beyond that, <laughs> I, there is a serious workforce problem in this country. And I think in your testimony, it was where you said that you expect like something like 50% of the workforce in your industry will, will be leaving within 10 years. What, do you, what are you all doing? I'll start with you and then each of you can answer to, to shortly, but what, what, what's the plan? <laughs> How do we deal with this or do we just you know, recruit more humans? Yeah, Senator, and part of that uh, problem that we're trying to address is with our apprenticeship uh, program. So with National Rural Water's help, we have the standards set up, and like I said in my testimony, there's 36 states, and North Dakota is one of them. We're relatively new in the process of apprenticeship. We have a workforce development coordinator. He's hired on, helps with systems, help navigate through all the, uh, the rules and regulations of the apprenticeship program. Um, just trying to you know, change the narrative in, in our business where um, in small town North Dakota, it's usually if your operator leaves, you know, who's the next person up? You just, you bring somebody in, they don't have the experience and it's kind of a, a vicious circle. So like I said, we're trying to change the narrative, change the culture where these are, it's a true profession. It's a great, great, noble profession. They do great work every day. So we're just working hard to um, use the apprenticeship program to get the next generation of, of workers. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, Senator White, out your uh, next. And, thank you, Chairman. And, 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 uh, Right now, it looks like Senator Mullen will uh, succeed uh, you, and then Senator Padilla, and then Senator Rickus. Okay, thanks. Please proceed. Mr. Volk, the uh, law provides 49% for additional subsidization. Is that customarily treated as a cap? Senator, the 49% the yeah, is, is the cap, I believe, and, and I know we've had some discussions with, um, you know, is that is that enough? Yeah, so assuming that it's a cap, what effect does it have on communities that don't have the ability to afford the match in terms of being able to access these IIJA funds? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We're struggling with that in, in North Dakota with getting the lead funding out where 49% subsidization, 51% would go on to the, to the customer and most of that lead is gonna be in your, your older neighborhoods, your disadvantaged, uh, communities, uh, so we're really struggling um, with, with getting that and, and finding a, a balance with the affordability. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Powell, in Rhode Island, we are seeing a lot of damage to our water treatment infrastructure related to climate change. We have very, very powerful, unprecedented rain events that have flooded out, for instance, 
a major city of ours, Cranston's a sewage treatment facility, and it's really unpleasant to be downstream when a sewage treatment facility floods out. Yeah. Uh, Narragansett has had to build a dike, a berm, around its oceanside sewage treatment facility. Warren, another town, is having to plan a very expensive move uh, with inter intermediate protection of its uh, water treatment facility. Um, how well does the IAJ fund um, the need that communities are facing to deal with these unprecedented flooding events driven by climate change and our relentless pollution uh, by the fossil fuel industry? Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for the question. Um, we ourselves are dealing with uh, the impacts of, of drought conditions. Um, earlier this week, we had a meeting to talk about uh, moving to a drought watch. So um, it really is impacting every community, um, East Coast, West Coast, North, South. Um, I think the structure is there in IIJA. Uh, the authorization is there. The appropriations need to be it's there. What's missing. I agree. Thank you. And let me also ask you about um, microplastics. We're starting to see that turn up more and more in drinking water. We see it appear in mother's breast milk. We see it appear in the end result in a baby's diaper that's obviously gone through the infant. Um, we see it falling in the rain in Colorado. And we don't really understand what the dangers are of microplastics when consumed by <laughs> humans. Uh, the bill provides $10 billion for what it calls emerging contaminants. Is it true that microplastics are only one of several emerging contaminants? Would have to share that uh, $10 billion if we were to be treated that way? And given the kind of upgrades that are necessary to deal with microplastics, is $10 billion a sufficient number? Uh, the short answer, Senator, is no. It is not sufficient. Uh, we've focused, focused a lot on PFAS. Um, we think that the which would be an emerging contaminant, which would which is an emerging yeah. contaminant, and uh, we are our projections to deal with that in drinking water are upwards of a billion dollars. Uh, we need to make sure Can you that say we our have projections. You mean your utility. WSSC water? Yes, yeah. sir. Um, so we we need to have regulatory certainty. We need to have a comprehensive roadmap to deal with emerging contaminants that are on the horizon holistically, so that we are not so that we're making our investments in infrastructure upgrades make sense. So I would wrap up by suggesting that some flexibility around the 49 percent for uh, communities that don't have a lot of resources and uh, additional funding for infrastructure that faces climate-related damage, flooding, drought drying out conditions, whatever they are, and an expansion of the 10 billion, which now has to cover both PFAS and uh, microplastics in addition to whatever other emerging contaminants are out there would all be helpful to you. Yes, sir. Is that a yes also? I saw your head nod, Mr. Volk. Yep. Yep, okay. And Ms. Beiser's also nodding. Thank you. Those head nods are important. And Mr. Senator White House doesn't miss them. He doesn't miss them. All right. I think uh, uh, next, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Mullen, you up. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, you know, it's, it, we all face unique challenges being from the Midwest and rural states like Oklahoma, North Dakota, um, and even, you know, major metropolitan areas such as you know, Boston, New York, San Francisco, L.A., uh, we all have issues facing us when it comes to clean water. Uh, sometimes it's policy related, sometimes it's neglect, sometimes it's a lack of funding. But what we do know is one size does not fit all. And, and we need to give uh, municipalities, states flexibility to, to allow them to make decisions for their unique areas. And a lot of times when Congress, we ha may have good intentions, sometimes it's politically driven, sometimes it's actually policy driven. And I think that's what we're trying to do here, Chairman, is, is have good sound policy. Uh, but one size never fits all. And, and when we throw tremendous amount of money, I mean, $55 billion is a lot of money still for anybody. I don't care who you are, it's a lot of money. And, and then we put restrictions on it. Uh, I think we hear from all of our witnesses is, is, hey, we know where it needs to go. We need the flexibility to, to do so, 
And, uh, and if we're going to be funding these projects, then we need to make sure that we get, it, get those dollars as close to the state, as close to the individuals providing the service as possible, and give them the tools uh, to, to do it without having the restrictions, which happens so often with federal funding, is that every dollar has so many stinking strings on it that they can't even access it. And that's what I believe Mr. Folk, you was saying a while ago, is that it's, which, what Senator Kramer was trying to say, is that just to get through the bureaucracy, to get to the funding, is a miracle sometimes in itself. And so my question to you, Mr. Folk, is what tools do you need for rural, for, for rural parts of the country, which is most of the Midwest, what would be most helpful? If the money is there, what tools do you need to access it? Yeah, Senator, uh, great question. Things we talk about all the time. The flexibility is, would be immensely grateful. I know visiting with our state folks, they would love that. The technical assistance. What, flexibility in, in what? Be able to use the dollars for certain projects without having restrictions on the projects. Be able to use uh, uh, flexibility on, on navigating the, the the bureaucracy. What you know, especially with this funding, like say with the uh, the lead lead component on our water side, um, we we run the risk in our state of maybe not spending down our first tranche of money as quickly as we can, and we we can't apply for the next set of money until we spend that down. And we run the risk at, um, if we don't apply for that, I believe before September 2024, we could lose that money and that would be reallocated to a state. So um, some timing flexibility for our state to navigate, let's say the, the lead where like the lead service line inventories are not due to the state until October 16th, 2024, but they have to apply for this new funding the next year's funding of the lead in September of 24. So the funding is kind of ahead at this point uh, of, the, of the true problem. The state does not fully um, know the magnitude of the total lead replacement. We have an idea, but some of the flexibility on that would, so be, timing. would be great. So they wouldn't run the risk of losing that. Um, it could maybe have a little more time or um, could use it at another point. Would it, would it be helpful instead of us, you know, each, municipality or each rural district um, uh, trying to apply for the grants themselves or the funding themselves, would it be helpful that if we were to allow, if, if Congress were to, through the EPA, were to just simply give the money to the states that have, like in Oklahoma, DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, in North Dakota, I'm sure you've got an environmental agency that, that, that could help manage it too. Give it to them and allow them to to help disperse the dollars in areas and set the timing that you need that's more, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's more designed to actually be practical for you guys to, to achieve what you're trying to get done. Yes, Senator, norm normally that's how it would work with their, their base funding through the SRF program. They have right. an intended use plan and uh, that they would go off and it's on a ranking system with their, you know, if there's uh, health issues or or things like that. So they have that flexibility. It's just some of the 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 tightness on some of this new the timing. That... So the timing is the mo thing you need the most help with. Sure. Okay. That, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Padilla, please welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me uh, begin, Mr. Chair, by just uh, reminding you how proud uh, I am of the work that this committee has done to address water affordability for underserved communities while also working to expand access to water reuse and recycling and reduce lead and drinking water. Uh, it served as a foundation for the Bipartisan uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as, as I know you're proud of. Um, now, this last June, I chaired a subcommittee hearing uh, examining the challenges facing water systems across the country and the impacts of aging water infrastructure, as we've been talking about uh, this, this hearing already and the effect that aging infrastructure is having on the ability of families to pay their water bills. The cost of water is rising. Household water and wastewater bills have increased 160% since 1998. And just to put it in context, that's a greater rate of growth than 
the rise in costs for electricity, for rent, or even medical bills. Now, in 2021, Congress created the Temporary Low Income Household Water Assistance Program in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also authorized a new EPA pilot program to help water systems address low income water affordability. The authorization for LIWAP, however, expires at the end of the month. So uh, I know Senator Cardin talked to you, Ms. Powell, earlier about uh, your experience in taking advantage of the resources available and what it meant for cons uh, customers that were able to receive aid. Uh, but can you just uh, emphasize for me in the committee, when the program expires at the end of the month, what you might be able to ensure that low-income customers are able to continue to afford their water and sewer bills? Thank you, Senator Padilla, for the, the question. Uh, at WSSC Water, we're also looking to develop new customer assistance programs and enhance uh, the customer assistance program that we already have. But we found that having LIWAP in place, we were able to assist more than 4,000 customers with the costs of their water and sewer bills. And that helped them get their accounts back in good standing. It also helped the utility to be able to move forward with our critical mission of investing in infrastructure and our people. Uh, one of the things that we're planning to do, and we've been working with uh, water and wastewater utilities across the country, is to advocate for a permanent program. We need the authorization, and then we need the appropriations. So you anticipated my follow-up question, which was exactly that. I know it's been a temporary program, but uh, it sounds like you believe a permanent program should be part of a federal safety net. Absolutely, because there are some uh, states and, and uh, communities that don't have the enabling legislation for individual utilities to have their own customer assistance programs. So having a federal low-income household water assistance program akin to LIHEAP, which helps with energy costs, exactly. um, is gas, appropriate for this? for this critical resource. So thank you. Thank you thank for that. You. Um, I won't raise the subject of PFAS. I think several of us have talked about it enough already, but I do want to associate myself uh, with uh, the comments, questions, and concerns raised earlier. So I'll ask instead about uh, uh, another issue, which is not unique to California, but California seems to be exhibit A on the need to emphasize disaster resiliency. You know, we've seen no shortage of both challenges and opportunities ensuring access to clean drinking water and safe wastewater, especially when it comes to natural disasters. Now, just last week, communities in and around San Diego faced a boil water advisory after the first tropical storm hit Southern California in 84 years. It was an anticipated hurricane, tropical depression by the time it uh, made landfall. Uh, and this comes after a winter where we saw more than 30 atmospheric river storms flooding communities throughout the state. And yet, we're still emerging from a mega drought that has stressed water supplies, not just in California, but throughout the West. And even here in the D.C. region, low flows have triggered drought operations. So another question for you, Ms. Powell. How has the D.C. drought impacted your operations? Uh, well, right now we have normal operations, but as I shared, uh, we did have a call earlier this week to talk about how we will uh, deal with the, the drought conditions um, at WSSC Water because we're making upgrades to our Potomac plant and we're also working to recover capacity in the reservoir that serves our Patuxent plant. Um, we have specific limitations, so the, the drought conditions are exacerbating um, the limitations that we have to provide treatment. So uh, it's really critical that we plan for the uh, not only the future where water supply is concerned, but we plan for resiliency, which is why we have been uh, working in the region to advance the water supply uh, resiliency product, uh, project that was in WERDA 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volk. I know you've spoken about the unique challenges facing rural communities. Anything else you'd like to add on how you prepare for flooding, droughts, wildfires, any other natural disaster challenges? Yes, Senator. In, in North Dakota, we, we do a lot of planning with uh, winter storms. Ice storms are, are very big and making sure that, you know, if the power is interrupted, that our, all our small communities can still keep, you know, enough water whether it's for citizens or if there would be a, a fire. So it is a, 
a concern that we have in our, our northern climate that, you know, we all have our uniqueness on that climate change and our climate resiliency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, Senator Kelly and Senator Sullivan are en route to, uh, to join us. Senator, up here before, before we, uh, you leave, I, I just want to say thank you for your leadership on uh, these issues and the leadership on your subcommittee that you chair. Thank you. And, and I should mention uh, the subcommittee hearing, very bipartisan in spirit. Uh, Senator Lomas is uh, my partner uh, on the subcommittee as, as a ranking member of that subcommittee. And so we're uh, working in a very bipartisan fashion, which I know you uh, try to do at every opportunity. Good. Well, you're a good team, so thank you. Thanks very much. Um, un until uh, we're joined by uh, Senator uh, Sullivan, uh, I, uh, I want to ask a, a question, if I can, maybe another question, uh, uh, Secretary Beiser, President Beiser. Uh, would you uh, please take a moment to discuss the disparity between the uh, amount of money that companies spend to manufacture PFAS and the financial burdens on communities that must handle the cleanup of these chemicals? Thank you, Senator. Um, my colleague in Minnesota and, and her agency recently did some studies on this very topic. And what they found is that it costs um, to buy PFAS about $50 to $100 per pound, and that the cost to remove and destroy PFAS is around $2.7 to $18 million per pound. And so there's quite a disparity between those two figures. That is quite a disparity. Uh, one, uh, one other question for, uh, for, all, uh, uh, for all of our witnesses. Uh, cybersecurity attacks on drinking water systems in the United States are of increasing concern, as you know, for utilities in the communities that they serve, as documented by a recent report by the American Water Works Association. What additional resources are necessary for utilities to both invest in the resiliency of their systems to uh, cyber attacks, as well as to respond to attacks as they occur? Mr. Volk, do you want to lead us off? Chairman, another great question. Um, for an association, we strive to provide that technical on-site assistance to our small and rural communities with the cybersecurity. Um, you know, even as rural and small state as North Dakota, we are very um, hooked up to the, to the world, which can be great and which can also be a curse too when the, the bad actors find us. We've had some recent instances in some very small systems that there have been people that have got on there, they don't know exactly what they're looking at. Um, luckily, we were able to stop that. And our state is very active. Uh, we've got some uh, very, very uh, intelligent experts working on that, and we're working hand in hand with our, our rural systems with them. Good, thanks for that. Ms. Powell, same question. Yes, sir. Uh, our cyber infrastructure is just as important as the pipes in the ground. Um, we have systems that are connected that have to be protected, and we're under attack. There are bad actors that are trying to um, access our systems, every water system, um, all the time. I think the water sector has become, uh, is increasingly becoming a prime target for bad actors. Um, and so the, you know, the long and short of it is that funding needs to be there to support uh, those efforts for cyber resilience as well. All right, thanks. Secretary Beiser. It's certainly a new challenge that is being presented to systems and a clear and present danger to those systems, but I think having funding for training and technical assistance, any necessary upgrades. But again, the focus should always be on public health and how we're keeping that top of mind. Thank you. All right, thank you. We've been joined uh, by, by uh, Senator Salt. Senator Sullivan, how are you doing? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, doing nice great. Nice to see you. Welcome. Okay, you you ready to go? Ready to go, as always. You're recognized. So uh, for the witnesses, thank you. Just real quick on the CERCLA question. I know it's an important one. Um, are, is in, I have a bunch of questions on some other topics, but uh, is it safe to say that all three of you agree that there should be some element of um, limitation on liability, particularly on the PFAS circular related issue? Is that, was that your testimony, Ms. Beiser? Senator, I think it's uh, a good conversation to have to look at any unintended consequences. We want to make sure that polluters are on the hook to pay and that we're not overburdening ratepayers, for example. So I think it's um, a topic that's worthy of careful consideration. Okay. How about you, Ms. Powell? I do think it's important for uh, water utilities uh, as passive receivers yeah. to, to have those protections and that the focus be on um, the polluters bearing the costs. It's like airports and other entities 
too, that all of a sudden are seeing like they might, I mean, in my state, a lot of these entities will go bankrupt and they weren't the reason for it. But what about you, Mr. Volk? Do you have a view on that? Yeah, the small and, and rural systems would, would totally agree they should not be held responsible for that and the polluters should, should pay. Okay, good. Um, Ms. Powell, and this is really for everybody, this administration talks a lot about environmental justice, environmental equity. I mentioned, I saw that in your bio. Um, I have no issue with that. The problem, and I've said it in this committee a million times before, the Biden administration has environmental justice and equity uh, with a big asterisk. If you're an Alaska native or indigenous person from Alaska, you don't get any environmental justice or equity. Uh, you, get it, you get attacked by this administration. So yesterday, we had another outrage, a legal outrage. The administration uh, canceled leases in Anwar despite Congress saying you had to do it. And then they restricted the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska, which was set aside by Congress like 70 years ago for oil and gas development. But, um, Mr. Chairman, I want to submit the um, joint Alaska delegation press release on this for the record. Without objection. The vast majority of the people in this press release are Alaska natives elected Alaska natives screaming, screaming. What are you doing, Deb Holland? Why are you taking away our jobs? Why are you taking our revenues? This is environmental injustice for indigenous people in my state. It happens every damn day with this administration. I've said it 50 million times in this committee. But why, why do they get so outraged? I want to show this chart. I've also shown it a million times in this committee. Um, that's the American Medical Association chart from 1980 to 2014, what places in America had life expectancy increases? And unfortunately, some places in America actually had life expectancy decreases, mostly because of the opioid epidemic. The place in our country that increased life expectancy the most by far was Alaska, up to 13 years. And it was in uh, our rural communities, our indigenous communities. Why? A, because it started really low life expectancy for Native Alaskans was the lowest um, in the country by far. But B, from 1980 on, we had responsible resource development, jobs, clinics, hospitals, very importantly, this panel, water and sewer. So my constituents' life expectancy in a lot of these places, North Slope, Lucian Island chain, Northwest Arkansas, up to 13 years, 13 years. Like, what's more important, I've asked this many times, Policy indicator of success, more important than, are the people you representing living longer? I don't know. I don't think there's anything more important. So yesterday, this administration took a whack at that. They're trying to make my constituents live less longer. Deb Holland, ironically, uh, it's just shocking. She's a Native American. She attacks Alaska Natives every time she opens her mouth. But anyways, what does that have to do with this hearing? Because a lot of the revenues that come from this kind of resource development go into water and sewer. Now, my state has over 30 communities that don't have any running water or flush toilets. I think that's the most of any state in the country. It's all indigenous people. So do you think that's environmental justice or racial equity? When American, by the way, they're most patriotic Americans in the country because they all serve at higher rates in the military, Alaska Natives, than any other ethnic group. So my question for the panel is, in terms of formulas, and by the way, the EPA administrator was in Alaska uh, the, just over August. We did a meeting with Alaska Natives on these issues. I showed them that chart. I've shown them that chart many times. So in terms of the formula for water and sewer, don't you think it should prioritize, just for fairness, call it racial justice, racial equity, just call it good old American fairness, the communities that don't have anything first. Like, there's a lot of talk about aging infrastructure on water and sewer, but I think sometimes we miss, like, no infrastructure. So can I get your, the witness's response to that? Just on a formula, shouldn't we be prioritizing communities in America that don't have anything. Flush, no running water, no flush toilets. American citizens. It's, it's not right in my view, but I'd, I'd welcome any views on that. Ms. Powell, maybe you can start. 
I'll, I'll be happy to start, Senator Sullivan, and thank you for the question um, and the awareness. I will say from a, a personal standpoint, and I've said it many times, I believe that equity is about communities having what they need so that all communities can thrive on equal footing. And like have, running water. Having been in the water sector for uh, some time, um, I, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the water sector, but I can tell you I don't know anyone that believes that we should trade the needs of the unserved or underserved for the needs of the unserved. I think every community needs to have what it needs, and I think that this historic investment in water and wastewater infrastructure or being able to provide wastewater, wastewater infrastructure needs to be fully funded. It needs to be sustainable and long-term so that every community can thrive on equal footing. Thank you. Anyone else? So we share your concern with making sure that we're getting funding to those who need it the most. And so we actually change a lot of our processes to ensure that we are reaching. We have a, a lot of communities who are bypassed over the years for water and wastewater services. So we, in, in getting our funding, canvassed all the county public health departments to find out which communities um, did not have service or did not have access to reliable service. And then we did outreach utilities to encourage them to do projects to connect those folks. And so, so far we've connected over 2,000 homes, or we were slated to connect over 2,000 homes to public water for the first time. And we're still working on that. So it did require us changing our process. And also we do give, um, you know, extra points on our criteria to make sure that we are um, meeting those needs of our residents in all parts of the state, especially our rural parts of our state. Great. Uh, Mr. Volk, you have a final thought on this? Yeah, in North Dakota, we've, we've worked hard um, with various state partners, federal partners, um, you know, to meet the gap of, of those underserved. Uh, not only um, we, we do have uh, four tribal nations um, to meet those needs, uh, there are other places in the state where, just like you described, where there is limited, you know, limited water, limited sewage. Even this day and age, it's it, it's crazy. And yes, those should should go go close to the top. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, Senator. Uh, glad you could join us, uh, Senator Capito. And then uh, I'll have a question or two, and then we'll wrap it up. Senator well, Capito. thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for being here today. Uh, very interesting to see rural, urban, big states, small states. We all have some similarities and some uh, some different concerns. My last question uh, is around risk communications. We had an incident in East Palestine, Ohio, where there was a train derailment uh, and uh, Great concern expressed by me and many others uh, about the impacts in our water in the water systems of the chemicals that were being carried, uh, hazardous materials that were being carried in in the train, how it was how it was handled. And one of the things that and we had a hearing on it. And one of the things that came out of the hearing was the risk communication, not just EPA, but uh, I'll use EPA in this case because you deal you all deal with EPA. In this case, was um, not as good as it could be. And so if you're in a community that is at risk because of an accident, a weather event, whatever, I'm sure you've all dealt with this. Uh, I've had this in my own community. The, uh, to have appropriate risk communication is absolutely essential. In other words, don't say something and take it back or don't say something and then expand on it 24 hours later. Uh, react immediately, use science, all these things. So I'm just gonna ask you, Secretary Beiser, um, what experience do you have in this, and how uh, do failures and risk communications uh, put additional burdens on on your state? Because you have you have your state entities reacting, your governor reacting, um, if, and, and I'm interested in the federal level risk communication. This is uh, thank you, Senator Capito. This is a very important issue, and one we spend a lot of time um, thinking about at the department because. Um, certainly when accidents happen or when you have, you know, one area we deal with it a lot and actually work with EPA on a lot is with PFAS. Because uh, as residents get testing uh, on their drinking water wells and find out that they have high levels of PFAS, uh, you want to make sure that you're providing folks with actionable science-based information, giving them what their options are, um, and making sure that you're consistent, as you pointed out. Um, we uh, try to spend a lot of time in advance thinking through what questions that residents will have. Um, sometimes you don't have as much time as you pointed out with um, East Palestine, 
uh, Palestine. But uh, we maintain web pages. We answer calls every day from residents who are concerned about these issues, and um, certainly work with our state um, fellow states, uh, local partners, and our federal partners in EPA to make sure that we have a comprehensive and and whole of department, um, whole, sorry, whole of government approach to ensure that no matter where they call, they get the same answer. We want to make sure that there's consistency across agencies. Right. I think that's really important, particularly with PFAS. You see it in the media all the time. Different types of reports. And um, EPA is, has not set the drinking, the, the, the drinking level, what we, which I've been pressing them for for probably now three years to do this. But they did set a level that's untestable. So if they come back with a drinking level that's higher than the level they put out last year that could have some risk to it, here you have confused messages to people who find this in their water systems. And, and so we got to get this right and, and so I appreciate what you all do every day because I know you're dealing with it with all different kinds of maybe possible contaminants and other things that happen. But uh, the general public relies on you to make sure that you, uh, the information that they're getting is not just accurate and timely and you're relying on other people to give you information. So I think that's an area that we really need to stay on and, and be as vigilant as possible. So thank you all very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Senator Capito. I have uh, one last question, and, uh, and then we'll uh, 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 wrap it up. Um, Ms. Powell, this one's for you. Uh, bipartisan infrastructure law included, as you'll recall, some $15 billion in funding for lead uh, service uh, replacements. Mm -hmm. uh, many districts uh, across our country have been uh, busy uh, this year creating service lines, uh, line inventories, and as assessing what kinds of problems exist in, in their respective uh, areas. Uh, has your water district been able to assess bipartisan infrastructure law funding to meet your obligations to replace lead service lines? And what are the challenges you're experiencing as you work to address uh, this challenge? Thank you for the question, Senator Carper. And as I shared in my testimony, I'm happy that part of our progress is receiving um, some projected funding for, lead, for our lead service line inventory and replacement work. Um, our lead service line inventory work is underway, and uh, we're developing a comprehensive program um, so that when we have that data, we'll be able to uh, help those that have lead service lines remove those lead service lines. We believe that most are on private property, uh, as, as we've been going through this process. So there will need to be policies to make sure that um, it uh, encourages the removal of lead service lines on private property that we don't have access to. There also needs to be the funding in place to help uh, those customers with, the, with that cost as well. So happy to report progress. We are receiving, projected to receive funding, and we'll look forward to uh, applying for more as we know more. All right, thank you for that. As, as we prepare to, uh, to, to close, I'm gonna give each of you uh, maybe 30 seconds, if you will, a, cl a closing thought you'd like to leave us with, and, uh, and then uh, we're gonna get ready to go start voting. Uh, Mr. Mr. Volk, closing thought, please. Yeah. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, thank you very much for um, letting me speak here on behalf of small and rural systems. Um, these systems, and I can speak on North Dakota, they do a great job day in and, and day out. Uh, a lot of them on, like we talked, the shoestring budgets and, and limited staff, but they, they do a great job. And I want to just put a shout out to all those that work with the systems, because sometimes in the water business, when you make the news, it's not for good things, and, and that, that's a shame. They do th great things every single day for the residents of not only our state, but the nation, and, and that profession should just be elevated to uh, of the highest level. So that's what I want to end with, recognizing those folks in the trenches. Good. Thank you. Good. Most appropriate. Ms. Ms. Powell. <laughs> thank you, sir, and thank you again, Senator Carper and Ranking Member Capito for having me here again. Uh, I always learn something when I come. What we, I would we do too. 
<laughs> what I would also uh, leave the committee with is the need to f focus on workforce as well. Um, we can talk about all of the funding we need for the infrastructure, but without having the people in place to maintain that infrastructure to protect those millions of dollars of investment, um, we'll be uh, putting money into, uh, you know, and not being able to maintain uh, those investments. So thank you, Senator Cap Capito, for your focus on workforce as well. And um, I just want to say thank you to Team H2O. All right, great. Thank you. I would uh, say before we get turned to uh, uh, Ms. Beiser, uh, during, I, I mentioned Senator Capito in an early conversation, during the month of August, we're in recess. It was, it was unusual for us to be out for a, a month. And uh, I spent part of that time just covering my state, my little state, and uh, visiting a lot of businesses, large and small, and, uh, and uh, nonprofits and other entities. And the question, I'd always ask three questions of them. I'd say, how are you doing? I'd say, how are we doing our congressional delegation, the federal government, state government? And what can we do to help? I can't tell you how many times people said, what we need is uh, folks will come to work. We need people who are trainable, who have a good work ethic, will come to work, will learn how to do, uh, do jobs. We have lowest unemployment rate I think we've had in years is about 3.5%. Uh, my la last time I checked out, I think we have about 8, almost 9 million uh, jobs open right now that we're trying to fill. We've got about 5 million people that are or allegedly are looking for work. And uh, we, uh, one of the challenges for us at the state level, the local level, federal level, is uh, workforce challenge, making sure we have the workforce with the, the skills that are needed in all kinds of jobs, including some of the ones that we're talking about here today. It's critically important. Ms. Weiser, please. First of all, thank you um, for having me here today to talk about this historic investment. But thank you for your leadership in making that possible. Uh, I'm going to continue the theme, uh, but with a slightly different take, which is the workforce development as it relates to state capacity to handle these, um, to handle our job. Uh, the grants that we're giving out, boomerang back to us in the form of permits, and we are facing an unprecedented level of retirement. To give you an example, a third of my department can retire in the next five years, um, but we have a 24% vacancy rate for engineers. Um, who are the ones? Say that again. How much? Twenty-four percent. Mm -hmm. And you can ask any colleague of mine throughout the country; they're going to give you similar numbers. This is a major focus um, across the country. Categorical grants um, from Congress make up twenty-five percent of my entire operating and staffing budget, and they remain stagnant. So while I know this is a policy committee and not funding, I will just put a plug in that there is a nexus there. That as we are seeing stagnant rates of funding, but our responsibilities are growing, uh, that in order for us to make sure that these programs are successful, we're going to need to make sure we have the resources to uh, recruit and maintain highly qualified staff. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by, uh, by Senator Kelly. Uh, stretch this out as long as we could, pal. And uh, you're, you're just in time. We're about to close this, close this down. Go, go right ahead. We're glad to see you. Oh, so I'm the, I'm the last one, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, you're worth waiting for. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for, for waiting. And uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for, for being here today. It's uh, important hearing. S uh, Secretary Beiser. So um, I want to begin by talking about PFAS contamination in drinking water. I imagine that may have come up already. <laughs> um, and as a member of the group of 11 Republicans and 11 Democrats that work to negotiate the bipartisan infrastructure law, one of the top priorities, my top priorities here, was dedicated funding for drinking water systems to respond to PFAS contamination. Uh, it's a problem in Arizona, but it's also a problem uh, across the country. You know, thanks to our bipartisan law, more than $10 billion is being allocated to drinking water systems across the country to address this contamination. And in the state of Arizona, this funding's already been put to work helping uh, drinking water systems, specifically in the southern part of the state, to install systems to remediate this growing PFAS plume that we see in um, the groundwater aquifer under uh, where uh, I live and where my wife lives, my granddaughter, who's two, it's under Tucson. And uh, since the infrastructure law was passed, the EPA has developed new drinking water standards for PFAS. And the new proposed maximum containment level uh, would be four parts per trillion um, instead of the current guidance, which is 70. 
so much lower. So Secretary Beiser, while the EPA has not yet finalized its drinking water standards, if the proposed levels were finalized, how would that impact our drinking water systems and how many additional systems um, in um, the state of Arizona, as an example, would be required to do this PFAS cleanup? Senator Kelly, first of all, thank you for your question and thank you for your leadership on this very, very important topic. Um, I um, can speak to North Carolina's yeah. experience with that, and we have 43 of our large you know, municipal and county systems that would not meet the four parts per trillion number that you cited as um, the proposed MCL. I will say, though, broadly speaking, what's needed is, um, you know, North Carolina got a head start because we had an industrial facility that uh, kind of forced us to be a leader in this area and learn a lot quickly. Um, but, and so we've had a number of years to do assessments, I think, nationwide. Um, states need funding to do assessments to get a handle on where PFAS is. Mm -hmm. The most cost-effective way um, to treat it is actually to prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, and so we need funding um, to see where it's coming from because the first step is to put down the shovel and stop digging, you know, stop putting it into the environment um, and look at how we can better control that piece of it. We also need to get a handle on where we're finding it. And so North Carolina has done extensive testing both in large water systems but also in small uh, we're in the process right now of testing over 650 of our small water systems, which serve mobile home communities, churches, daycares, other sensitive um, population centers. And so having the funding, having the ability to do that comprehensively is going to help us get our arms around it overall and also ultimately decrease the amount of treatment costs that we're going to have associated with making sure that our drinking water is um, safe for public health. Do you, do you have a sense in North Carolina then um, how you would have to scale mm -hmm. the removal system to get from 70 to four, like how many more systems would you have to add and what do you think that cost would be? So uh, since there's not currently a drinking water standard, there had not been a lot of systems that were currently put into place. Uh, we do have two water systems that are larger that um, because of PFAS contamination, that they were hi higher levels of PFAS contamination coming from the Cape Fear River. Mm -hmm. They had um, both put in place one a reverse osmosis system and the, another a granular activated carbon system. So those are our two examples that we're looking to right now. Based on their experience and the costs associated with the implementation of those systems, we're estimating between 661 million and 1.3 billion for those 43 large water systems to come into compliance to be able to meet the four parts per trillion um, number. That does not include the small water systems that are going to need to put filtration in place. And so we don't have a number there yet because we're still, um, re uh, results from those, those tests are starting to roll in, but we don't have a complete picture. And do you, do you know of any other, I mean, are there any future uh, methods to remove PFAS, anything that is being developed or any innovation out there that could get us to four parts per trillion at a potentially a lower cost? Sure. So the reverse osmosis systems and the granular activated carbon systems are the two most commonly and, and very efficient measures that we have available to us today. I know there's a lot of research and development that's ongoing. I know within our university system, they're looking at potential opportunities, but there are none that are scalable and that I'm aware of um, that are uh, commercially and wide, you know, available in a widespread fashion yet. But I am encouraged that we have a lot of research and development going. I think we need more research and development not only on the treatment systems themselves, but also how to um, assess and, and treat the spent media associated with those so that we have um, the ability to destroy the PFAS and not just perpetuate it within the environment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks for making the extra effort to, uh, to, to join us. Um, uh, I, I, I want to really um, close where, where we began, and that's to thank you for not just uh, for showing up today, uh, not just for preparing uh, today, for today, and not just uh, for your, uh, your thoughtful responses to the questions and the issues that, 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 we've, uh, that we've raised. Uh, the members of this committee are very proud of the uh, work that we've done on infrastructure for our country. And it's not something we do just at the federal level, as you know, it's state and local and private sector and nonprofits and, and, and so forth. Uh, so it's a very much a, a team, uh, a team uh, effort. Uh, Matthew 25, when I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? I mean, how this doesn't get any more important than, uh, than that in water, knowing that when we turn on the spigots, that what we're going to drink is uh, safe for us and for, for our, uh, our, our, our families. The, um, 
we, we usually have good uh, uh, attendance uh, at our hearings, but uh, this has been exceptional. And I think it's reflective of how important my, our colleagues, Democrat and Republican, regard the, these issues and the need to continue to make progress. Everything we do, we know we can do better. And uh, that's, uh, you've given us uh, some good uh, input as to how we might be uh, 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 guided missiles as opposed to unguided missiles. Um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Act made uh, historic investments, as we said earlier, in drinking water infrastructure across uh, our nation. Uh, but there's still a lot of uh, work to do, as Robert Snow, I think, would say, Robert Frost would say, miles to go before we sleep. Miles to go before we sleep. Still plenty of work to do. Uh, Congress, uh, we have every intention of staying active, remaining active. It's not just enough to write legislation, introduce legislation, vote on legislation, committees and on the floor. Uh, it's, we got to do our job as for oversight. And this is a, it's an important part of our job, and this, is, this hearing is part of, of that, uh, that oversight. But we want to stay active uh, to work with our state and our local partners to ensure that the reliable, safe wa drinking water remains uh, available uh, to everyone in this country who has it, and they, for those who don't have it, that they, they get it. Uh, before we adjourn, just a, a couple of uh, final items. I, 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 let me say, say to our, our staffs, we have, uh, have um, I say more than some wonderful members of this committee, both sides of the aisle. We also are blessed with great staff, and uh, these hearings don't just occur. Uh, the, uh, the staff collaborates, they work together, they pull together, there's a thoughtful uh, panels of uh, witnesses uh, week after week, month after month, and today's no, uh, no exception. But uh, this is my, one of my favorite parts of uh, hearing. I, I get to ask unanimous consent to uh, enter into the record materials related to today's hearing. And I would add that senators will be allowed to submit written questions for the record through the close of business on Thursday, September 21st, uh, 2023. The thing I like about this is because when I ask unanimous consent, there's nobody here to object. <laughs> I know I'll get my way. <laughs> So, hearing no objection, we will uh, compete, uh, compile rather those questions. We're going to send them to uh, all of you, and we'd ask that yours by reply to us by uh, tomorrow. No, no, by Thursday, October fifth at high noon or something there thereabouts. So Thursday, uh, October fifth, and uh, anything else? Um, I think with that. Uh, it's a wrap. I'd like to say one last thing to our friend from North Dakota. I know you didn't go to North Dakota State, but uh, take, uh, just to t tell your friends out there, take it easy on the blue hens. And uh, we're <laughs> easily <laughs> bruised and battered, and especially with guys as big as you. <laughs> it's not a fair fight. All right. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be with all of you today. Take care. God bless.